she's coming back tonight, and uh, and yeah, it was good. So we went to the Lake District, uh, drove, we drove to Lake District, oh, sorry, we didn't drive, I drove to Lake District. <laughs> so one thing when, where Biloshna never helps, um, and then spent a few days there, and we went to London, and then from London, I drove back. So to be, to be fair, it's been a week, but it, my, my mind still thinks I'm still driving. <laughs> so pray for me that my, my brain realizes that we, we've, gone back, we've come back to Edinburgh now. So it's been good. It's been really, really good. And I hope that you guys have had a good time as well. And so good to see you back and back for the winter. Good to say that? Get, getting ready for the winter. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about that after the barbecue. Oh, sorry, after the picnic. There's no barbecue. So um, really good. Emma and Lee's wedding are coming, is coming, so really, really excited for them. Vilushna and I, we got a chance to meet with them. We had a, a meal together, so I know they are very excited. And uh, I just wanted to also recognize that Steve is going to officiate the wedding. So I'm really looking forward to hear what Steve has for them and also for the, for the people who are going to be there. So really excited for quite a big week for you guys. So that's great. Um, I also wanted to mention about MP's uh, brother. It was... It was a sad news to hear. It's never easy when you lose someone. It's never easy, no matter how prepared you are. Uh, but then when you lose somebody at the, such a young age, uh, un unprepared when uh, got a misdiagnosis, and then he was eventually uh, diagnosed with stage four cancer, which is uh, not, not great. So um, uh, I, I, I spoke to Mercy on, on Friday, and I, I told them uh, we're praying for them, we're supporting them. If they need anything, we are right here. Um, I mean, you know, one, one thing that uh, really hits me is for people like us, we, we leave our family and we come to, here to work and to live. Um, it's hard when you lose somebody who is far because the flight ticket at short notices can be very expensive, especially if you want to go to Mauritius. Anybody has Googled a ticket to Mauritius, you will know how expensive it is. Um, I've got my grandma who's 96 years old. She's in good health, but I know one day she will, she will go to be with the Lord. So uh, do pray for us, do pray for MP, and uh, uh, so that you know, uh, God can bring comfort and peace uh, to the whole family. And I would also like to commend Pearl and Olive today. Um, you know, MP did welcome last week. Uh, Pearl and, and Olive led prison worship today. Um, I understand, thank you. Uh, I understand that as, as we speak here, uh, the funeral is happening in Zim uh, at the moment. So I, I would like to commend them for choosing to be here, yeah. choosing to be with the Lord, to lead prison worship while such a big thing is happening. You know, uh, your reward is from the Lord. God bless you for, choosing, for doing that, and, and we know that God has a plan for you guys. So really well done for, for leading prison worship. Um, actually, when, when she was singing, she said, uh, and your mercy will never fail me. I, I thought, uh, she's got two mercy. The mercy of God will never fail her. Mom will also never fail her. So that was really good. Uh, great. So uh, we'll, we'll shift to the Word of God now. Um, um, so I'm, I'm going to do something slightly different to what I have, I'm usually used to do. Um, I don't have a, a sermon of three or four points for you this morning. So um, I'm going to do something different. It will be, I, 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 think, I think it's going to be a bit of a short sermon. Uh, as I kind of settle in that, God is trying to get me out of my comfort zone. So I'm going to take a passage in the Bible. We're going to read through it. And I'm going to expand on each of the verse, which is different to what I usually do. So I'm going to ask you to, to kind of bear with me as I do this. And uh, it's going to be less of me words. So there won't be much of my words, more of um, God's word here. So as I get used to my new uh, glasses as well. So I don't know how you do this. Every time it gets kind of a bit steamy. So what's, your, what's the tricks? Is there anything that I need to do? <sighs> this morning he said to me that I've got white hair. <laughs> And now he's telling me I shouldn't be sweaty. <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, that's why I love him that much. <laughs> so uh, bear with me as we, we go through that. I knew something like that was going to happen. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about when you don't know what to do. What do we do when we don't know what to do? Let's read in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. For we have no power to face this vast enemy that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. For we have no power to face this vast enemy that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. 
but our eyes are on you. Let us pray. Let's close our eyes. God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And as we lean on to you this morning, we pray that you're going to bring out a revelation for us. A revelation from your word, not from me. God, in fact, I want none of me in this. I want all of you. Help me, God, so that I can understand, I can take this, I can receive this, and I can put it in practice in my own life first. God, I pray that somebody somewhere is going to be blessed by some of those words here. Help us, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit be at work and show us the way. Show us how to deal with those situations that sometimes we really struggle and we, we cry out and say, we don't know what to do. We do not, cannot take it anymore. But God, we help us to learn how to get our eyes on you and on you alone. I've got a photo. I think that's coming up. Um, and that photo is not a photo of uh, the kind of road you would take when you're doing your driving test. Um, <laughs> Vicky, Vicky was telling me this morning, if she was to get something like that, she would drive straight, which is the easiest route. See, how many of you have ever faced a situation like this? You're standing, like, can you bring back the, the photo, please? You're standing in a road, but there's so many options. There's so many options, and you don't even know which one to take. How many of you? Yeah, it might be in your finances, it might be in your health, it might be in any aspects of your life. Sometimes even you're at a crossroad, there's two options. Which one do I take? Which guy do I go and date? Which job do I go with? Which which one do I choose? And we don't know uh, which one. It it is always difficult to make decisions when there's multiple options because you know that there's only one of them leads to God's plan, and God has a plan for your life, and you want to choose the one that God has for you. But which, how do you know which one to take? But, but, but the worst thing is when there's no road at all. You're faced with a situation, and you, know, you, look, at, you, you, you look out at all your options, you, you realize that I don't have any options. How many of you have been through that in your life where you don't even know what to do? So the question is, what do you do when you don't know what to do. There's an old Arab proverb that says, all sun shines and no rain makes a desert. Life is a mixture of good times and bad times, ups and down, high and rows and mountains and valleys. So today I want to talk to you about how do you, um, how do you navigate in those valleys that you go through. Sometimes those valleys are for a few hours and can get stressful, sometimes for a day, for a week, for months. Sometimes for years. I was praying the other day for Pastor Glenn and Pastor Pastor Emeritus, Pastor Glenn, Pastor Terry. And uh, I was I was just thinking about them leaving back in, in March, April, and today we're sitting in July. They're still not back. More than a year going through what they're going through. But yet still standing strong in God's word. Because the last time I was talking to Pastor Glenn, he was giving me all these tips about how to, you know, preach and all these stuff. And you can tell that he's so much connected with God, more than ever before. The thing is about these situations is that they bring you closer to God, don't they? Every Christian goes through a season of trials. It is true that every trial is different, and that God says he will not test you more than you can endure. But it does feel that, that sometimes. When you're going through those situations, it feels like it's never-ending. And how many of you have said it myself, God, I cannot take it anymore. What do we do in those moments? You know, our God is a God of our mountains, but also a God of our valley. I'm afraid to say that I wish I could preach to you how to have a trial-free life, how to have a struggle-free life, how to have a battle-free life. If you discover it, by the way, come and tell me, because I don't think there's such a, such a thing as a battle-free life. In fact, there's a reason why we go through those trials, and that's because there's something that God wants to do in us that he can only do, that can only be accomplished while you're in those valleys. Is that so? Isn't that true? If life was rosy, perfect, do you think we would be sticking with God and just pressing on to him and having faith in him the way we do when we go through those valleys and those struggles? I do think that those trials help us to connect better with God. Sometimes we're going through a situation or a battle, and as we pray and look up to God for an answer, 
We also give him a deadline. How many of you do that? We want him to give you an answer uh, within a particular time frame. God, I need an answer today. I need a breakthrough tomorrow. Or I need this to be sorted by the end of the week. But sometimes we forget that God is not confined by space and time. We know that we need to learn to align with his timing. The question still remains, what do we do when we go through those situations where we don't know what to do? What do we do when we feel helpless? You know, we, we as a family, we were going through a similar situation where uh, we needed an answer. And uh, at one point, the accountant as I am, I like to plan, I like to have multiple plans. If plan A doesn't work, I like to have a plan B in place. I like to have a plan C in place. Trish is smiling there because she knew that's true. Uh, I like to have multiple options so that if one doesn't work, I have something else to, 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 to kind of fall onto. But it's frustrating it's, and it's so tough when in that situation that plan B didn't work, plan C was an option, plan D, I had no idea how it was going to come to pass. And all I had was the plan A that I was waiting. And I felt so helpless. So, so helpless. Because I knew it impacted my family, impacted my future, it impacted everything that we, go th we were going through. I felt so helpless. I didn't know what to do. God reminded me of one thing. Trust me. I will provide. I will open that door for you. How many of you, you've been through those situations where you felt helpless? Can I have an amen for that? You have? Um, I don't know about you, but every time I face those situations, there's one place that I look up for answers, and that is in the Bible. So today I'm, I'm going to, to take a, a passage in the Bible, and um, in fact, not, not someone, but an entire kingdom that got to a position where uh, they felt helpless. They didn't know what to do. They were facing the threat of annihilation, death, the end of their, their, their kingdom, the end of their world. And I'll try to expand on that a little bit to, to look, look at a few points that God has laid on my heart. As I said to you, it's more about that passage in the Bible that I believe that will bring a revelation in your own situation than the words that I'm going to, to expand on that. It was difficult because when, when I was praying for that, the words were not coming. I'm like, God, why is the word not coming? And then God said, that's because I want that word, the, the passage of that Bible, to open up to people, and that becomes a revelation for them. So um, I'm telling you, this is, this, is, this is going to be interesting for me. Um, so I read on 2 Chronicles 2012, for we have no power to face this vast enemy that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are renewed. So I'm going to rewind a bit to look at this entire passage in 2 Chronicles 20. And I've got a photo for you here just before I kind of go and expand on the whole story. I'll read the whole story, and then we'll take it step by step. So, so this is basically Israel uh, back in the days in 2 Chronicles. And in that, you will see uh, there came a point in... Uh, in the life of Israel where uh, Solomon had died and the kingdom of Israel had split into two, it became the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. As you can see, the blue and the, uh, I can't know, is it yellow, orange? What is that, the other one? <laughs> is it yellow? Brilliant, thank you. I, I can't seem to see that, so yellow. So, <laughs> so yellow, so two kingdoms, kingdom of Israel and kingdom of Judah. And Jehoshaphat was the king of the kingdom of Judah. He was the fourth king of the kingdom of Judah. And you look around, you'll see that in the area, in the surrounding area, there's a few neighbors there, some really nice, some really bad neighbors, you know, uh, as you know, in, in every country. Um, and one of them is the kingdom of Moab, where you have the Moabites. Uh, you'll see, if you look at this there, it's basically in the southeast coast of Israel there. And then you'll see the kingdom of Ammon, which is where uh, they call themselves the Ammonites, uh, and which is on the east coast of Israel, really just on the uh, on the right. And then you have the Meunites, which is a tribe within the kingdom of Edom, and you will see that on the south side of uh, of Israel. So, what I'll do is I'll read the whole passage, as I said, uh, and then uh, I'm going to take one by one, verse by verse. We'll expand. I don't know what time we'll finish. 
but uh, I'm hoping by five we'll be done. I hope that's okay. <laughs> so it's 2 Chronicles 20, verse 1 to verse 256. Sorry, no, two, verse 28. So let me start by reading. Uh, I'll be very proud if Benjamin does well by making sure all these verses appear on up here, uh, by the way. So uh, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 1 to 28. So uh, here comes. Uh, after this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Meonites came to wage a war against Jehoshaphat, uh, kingdom of Judah. Uh, some people came and told Jehoshaphat, vast an army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazan Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Uh, then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord uh, in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? The, you rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel uh, and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. They've lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, um, if calamity comes upon us, uh, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will, be a, you will hear us and save us. Verse 10. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, Seir, uh, whose territory um, you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Verse 12, our God, uh, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast enemy that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's the, the, the verse I quoted before. Verse 13, all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Then the spirit of, of, of the Lord came on Jehaziel, uh, son of Ze Ze Zechariah, uh, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Metaniah, a Le Levite and descendant of Asaph, and he stood in the assembly. Goodness me, I'm sure I messed up some of those names here. Um, verse 15, he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, um, so that is Jehoshaphat speaking, he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Ju Judah and Jerusalem, this this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged um, because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Can you repeat that after me? But the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge or in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight the battle. Interesting. Uh, take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the, uh, from the Kohathites, Kohathites, and the Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the Lord, the God of Israel, with a loud voice. Early in the morning, uh, verse 20, they left for the desert of Tekoa as they set out. Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out um, at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord for his love and Jews forever. Verse 22, As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount, Mount Seir, um, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and, and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir and to destroy it and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, Seir, is that how you say it? Seir? I suppose so. 
uh, here they help to destroy one another. Verse 24, when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert, the desert, desert is something else, uh, the desert, and looked towards the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. No one. Goodness. The vast army, no one could escape. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry uh, off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. 20, verse 26, on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Beraka, uh, where they praised the Lord. This is why it is called the valley of Beraka uh, to this day. Verse 27, then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to reju rejoice uh, over their enemies. Verse 28, they entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps, lyres, and trumpets. That is the longest passage I've read ever. <laughs> by the way, that marks the end of my sermon. Thank you for coming, and God bless you. <laughs> oh dear, I need to, to clean my face now because uh, that was a long one. Um, you, you won't believe how much I had to practice those names to try and get 10% right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I am so glad I've done it. So um, it's a long passage, but it is a very, very interesting passage. I have to say I was so blessed when I read it because there's so much in it. There's so, so much in it. Let's break that passage down. Verse 1, after this, the Moabites and Ammonites, with some of the Meonites, came to wage a war against uh, the kingdom of Judah. So what is happening here is there's three kingdoms which are neighbors to the kingdom of uh, Judah. They've come to the realization very quickly that individually, by themselves, they cannot fight them because uh, the kingdom of Judah has a very strong army. So what they do is that they, they make an alliance to defeat King Jehoshaphat. They knew the kingdom of Judah was very strong, and that's why they wanted to come together, despite their differences, because the fact that they were fighting against themselves uh, tells me that there were some differences, just for the purpose of uh, trying to bring down King uh, Jehoshaphat. They come together to attack Judah. So that is my first observation now, is during the course of your Christian journey, there come a time, or sometimes multiple times, when we look around us, we do not just see one area of our life being attacked, but multiple areas. It feels like these demons have made an alliance with, between themselves to come and attack us for the same time. As you're trying to get a grip of your finances and you see some lights down the tunnel, you realize that your health is being attacked. And as you're dealing with your health, you come to the realization that your marriage is being attacked. How many of you have been in situations like this? I have. I have. And that is how the devil works. He knows that we're getting, we, 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 are, we know how to, to deal with one situation at a time. What he does is he sends multiple demons, sends multiple issues to try and attack us, to bring us down. So that is my first observation. Verse 2 goes, some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom. From the other side of the Dead Sea, it is already in Hazazan and Tamar, alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. What did God tell me here? Observation number two. See, when King Jehoshaphat hears the news, what does he do? The Bible says he inquires of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast. My question to you is, what do we do when we are attacked? When we see an attack coming our way, what do we do? Do we always systematically go to prayer? Do we systematically seek the Lord? Or do we try to look at 
what resources we have first to see whether our resources can help us resolve that issue, whether our network can help us have an answer to that situation, or whether we can get somebody to help us physically to deal with that situation. I think for me, as I grew up, my default setting was to go and look into trying to sort things out myself. Do we not do that sometimes? But what God tells us is the God way, the right way of dealing with a situation when you don't know what to do is to, put you, to kneel down. See God's face. Pray. Fast sometimes if you need to fast. Can I hear an amen for that? And that is why we have Accelerate. You know, I've said it to the church all the time. If there's one thing I'll keep us going from victory to victory as a church, from glory to glory, it is prayer. That is why we have more Accelerate. And if you've not had a chance to join us for the last time we did it, I would encourage you to do it next time in November when we come together. We had a, an amazing time when we met on Wednesday morning on the week we did it. There was like 20 people at the, at the back hall praying, starting the prison worship. We had breakfast, very light breakfast, and we prayed. And we spent the Wednesday, the Thursday, and the Friday. And as I was going through the Thursday and the Friday, I knew in my heart that I had an, an army of Hope Church behind me. A lot of people supporting and praying and fasting towards one common goal. And of course, there was a lot of people who shared uh, some prayer topics, which is still at the back, by the way. And we got a chance on Friday evening to pray for every single one of the, the prayer topics we, got, we, we received. And that is where when you go through something, you've got your church behind you praying. There is power in prayer. And that is exactly what Jehoshaphat is doing. He's leaning onto God because he knows that it's a huge army coming his way. He doesn't have enough people. He knows he will be defeated if he goes by them by himself. But when he relies on God, when he counts on God, when he seeks God's first, he knows victory will be his. And if you do the same thing in your challenge, in your struggle, when I do the same thing, I know that victory will be my power. Amen? That is observation number two. As I said, it's different this time. So verse number 14, um, then the spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Metaniah, the Levite, the descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. I'm starting to enjoy those names now. He said in verse 15, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow march down against them. They will, they will be climbing up uh, by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of uh, the gorge of the desert uh, of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. You will not have to fight this battle. I was very intrigued by that. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. I don't like that. I'm, I'll tell you, my, when I first read that, I was like, I've got an army coming my way, and you're telling me, go, I will be with you. I am the kind of guy who likes a bit of more assurance than that. Uh, how are you going to do that? What's going to happen? Is that, so, is that not true? Observation number three. This part is a prophecy, right, from Jehaziel. He's speaking on God's behalf, and that is the reason we do Touching Heaven. You know, we come out as a church, we have our services, but it's a little bit more programmed. We have a run sheet uh, because, you know, it's online and it's a little bit more organized. But we also do Touching Heaven where we don't have a run sheet. And there's a reason we don't have a run sheet because we want God to move a little bit more freely. Every Touching Heaven I've been through has been different because you never know what God has for you. I've been where uh, God's speaking and I was like, what is that person talking about? And then I realized that it's for somebody specific. And then somebody is talking about something else. And we're just praying and we just move into the flow of the Holy Spirit. If you've not been to Touching Heaven, this is an amazing time when you can get to connect and listen and hear what the Lord has for you. 
get to connect with like-minded people in the spirit. How many of you enjoy touching heaven? And I, it is a moment where somebody can speak into your life and your situation and share God's plan for you. Somebody who probably have no clue what you're going through. No idea. Out of revelation, out of uh, a push from the spirit, they will say something that is so relevant for you. And you can feel encouraged by those words. Observation number four, you will not have to fight this battle. What do you mean by that? How is that possible? You're telling me to pack my bags, drive to the hospital on the day of the surgery, and that I, will, I won't need surgery. Hmm. You're telling me to go for this interview, and they will offer me a job even without being interviewed. Or you're telling me that I'm going through a financial struggle right now, that somebody will knock at my door and give me the thousand pounds I need to settle that debt. That sounds impossible, but that is exactly what I'm telling you. God works in a million ways, probably a billion ways, or even a trillion ways. Jadun will tell me a quadrillion ways, but he is not short of ways to help you resolve your struggle. Whatever you're facing, he has a way to help you. Even if you and I were going through the same situation, he will come away, he'll come with a way to help you, and he will come with a totally different way to help me. He can touch somebody's heart to knock at your door and to help you. I've heard scores of testimony where families didn't have food and they were praying and somebody just knocked at their door and have a bag of groceries. I just felt I want to bring, I should bring this. I've got no idea why, but I just wanted to bring this for you. I heard a pastor giving a testimony why many, many years ago. He had lost his job. He had to preach. He went to preach. He was just a volunteering pastor. He wasn't paid. Uh, he'd lost his job. And there came a, t- a point where he had no money left. And he knew he needed a job or he needed some of his debts paid. Somebody just knocked at his door and said, I don't know why I was praying. I just felt like bringing you 5,000 pounds. I was like, wow, this is the God that we serve. And that is the kind of faith I want us in Hope Church to have. Not the kind of faith of uh, whether I want to do this or that, whether I want to have a blue car or a green car. Not the kind of, I want, do I want a, a, a three-bedroom house or a five-bedroom house? A faith that is so strong that you believe in the impossibility of it happening and you count on God that it can happen. So that is exactly what I'm telling you. Drive to the hospital and believe, the God, believe in God that it can heal you and you, can, you, have, you will come back without even having to have a surgery. But even if you have to have surgery, God can heal you. As I said to you, there's a million ways he can come up with to heal you. Go for that interview. I remember doing an interview. A um, uh, few minutes after the interview, some, uh, the person called me back and said, you know what? I want to offer you a bigger position that way I interviewed you before. That is the God that we serve. You go for an interview for one thing, and you get a bump up for something bigger. This is God. And that 1,000 pounds, maybe it's, for me, it's a big amount of money. But maybe it's 500 pounds, or maybe it's 10 pounds, or 100 pounds. Maybe it's 10,000 pounds. Whatever it is, believe God, and he can answer your prayer. That is the God we serve, friends. It is when there is no hope that God tells us that is my element. That is what I can do. I can do the impossible for you. Observation number five. He tells them to march down, take position, and stand firm. That is interesting. And then he said, despite saying that they won't have to fight a battle. Why would you tell me to march down, to take position and stand firm, and then you tell me I won't have to fight a battle? I could be sleeping in my room, and then you just do what you have to do, and it's all sorted, right? Why do God ask them to do that? See, if you sit in your home and watch Netflix while God is fighting your battle, nothing will happen to your faith. Nothing. God wants to see, to, God wants to use that situation to strengthen your faith in Him. He wants you to know that you can trust Him. He wants that situation, He wants you to see His hand moving. And you can only see that while you're in the battlefield with Him, seeing Him do what He does best, not when you're sitting at home watching Netflix. 
you know, when we were going through that situation in the family, uh, the reason I'm, why I'm not giving you too much detail because it's in the making and I'm believing God that is going to be a huge miracle and it's very close. Um, we got, we, we've been waiting for a long time. We prayed and fasted and it was the time when I got the answer that it's going to be positive when I saw the tears in the eyes of Kenesha's eyes. We have a, record, a video that we recorded when we got uh, the positive answer and she was crying. That was the first time she saw God in action, God hands moving tangibly in our lives that she understood what was happening. It was beautiful for me to see that. I don't want to fight her battle. I don't want my wife to fight my battle. We all have to fight our own battles, but remember that we rely on God because he fights our battle. Amen? Verse 20. I am not halfway yet, so please be with me. Uh, early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. My observation. You see, King Jehoshaphat understood what he thinks will affect what he say, and what he say will affect what he sees. I'll say it again. What he thinks will affect what he says, and what he says will affect what he sees. That is why he reinforced his thoughts and his mind with God's word uh, spoken through the prophet. He brought the prophet for a specific purpose because he wanted to hear what God's word, word is so that he can captivate, his mind can captivate what God has. And the words that came out of his mouth were aligned with God's plan and they were words of encouragement. Question to you is, what are you confessing in your situation? What is coming out of your mouth? What are you proclaiming? What are you saying in that situation? Are you like me, like, oh, no, I don't think I'll be able to do that. I think I'm going to fail that test. Or are you going to believe that, you know what, I think I'm going to make it. I think he will open a door for it to happen. I don't understand why. I don't know how he will do it, but I know he can do it because my God is the God of the impossible. Nothing uh, is impossible for him. Amen? Verse 21, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out uh, at the head of the army saying, uh, give thanks to the Lord for his loves and Jews forever. So what he does, he appoints Nikki um, and Pearl to lead praise and worship. And that is important. It may sound a bit uh, stupid to do while you're going through uh, somebody trying to annihilate your entire, um, your, your entire kingdom. Uh, instead of kind of training your army, getting them ready to fight, you get a, a group of people to sing and, 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 and dance for you. That is... It sounds a bit weird. Weird for the, probably for, for the trained, you know, army generals. But for the Lord, it's different because that was not a battle of the physical that was going to happen. That was a different battle that was going to happen. And it was going to happen only by praise and worship. So this is the power of praise, power of prayer and praise and worship. A lot of time we go through a battle and we keep it for ourselves. We feel unsafe to share it with others. I will encourage you this morning to speak to somebody you trust. It could be a leader at the church. It could be a department leader. It could be a connect group leader. It could be a friend in church. But it's important to speak to someone you trust. Now, I want to share something with you here. That at Hope Church, I have spoken to every leader here in, the, in one of the last LVL about the importance of confidentiality. So if you feel safe to speak to someone and you ask that person to keep it for themselves and pray, that thing will stay with that person. Even as the overseer, I'm not supposed to know, and everybody knows that. And I've told them how it's important that we bring that atmosphere of safety and security that everybody can feel safe and can share the things that are deep or even sometimes sensitive or personal. It's between you and God, but sometimes you need a friend to help you through that situation. You can't do everything by yourself. That is why I encourage people to fill in a prayer card. 
if you can. I st stress on the importance of a prayer card and, pr and praise report because I believe that corporate prayer, God answers that. When the church is praying for you in your situation, God will answer it. Um, when I did, um, uh, I think it was when I, when I did um, um, Vision Sunday, uh, I said that last year I estimated uh, that we got positive responses for more than 70% of the things we prayed for. And this year I'm believing that, believing that it's going to be more than that. Because that is who it is. It is not me doing the miracle. It's God's doing the miracle. We do our part. He wants you and I to partner with him. We don't do the miracle. He does. But he needs that partnership. He needs that participation from you and I. When you do this, it will be like King Jehoshaphat did in verse 21. You have appointed someone to pray for you and sing praises to God on your behalf while you're going through your battle. On the way to the hospital, there's somebody's praising God for you. Somebody's singing out for you. You're singing, Jehovah Nisi, fight your battle. And that is, that is really beautiful to have. Verse 22, I think it's probably getting close now. Uh, As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against uh, the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, uh, who was invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir and destroyed and annihilated them. Uh, after they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. This is the part we do not generally see. See, when we are going through those struggles, we don't know what God is doing on the other side. God is creating a situation and uh, creating confusion between them, and they're fighting with each other. That's the invisible part. It is the expression of your faith that activate this part. When we go through a situation, we only know what we know, and we only see what we see. We have a limited perspective, right? We only see that bit. But God, on the other hand, has what I call a helicopter perspective. He sees the whole thing. He knows the past. He knows what happened. He knows what's happening. And he also knows what's going to happen. And that is why it's important for us to rely on him. Because he sees everything. Verse 24, he says, When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the, the desert and, and looked towards the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. Wow. Imagine the excitement when they saw their enemies were dead. Imagine the excitement when you received that letter that you've been accepted. Imagine that phone call that you got uh, saying that you've been free for that, from that disease. Or that email you get telling you that your debt has been fully paid. That's what's happening here. That's what's happening. Verse 25, so Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than what they could take away. They took three days to carry the whole thing. This is what our God is. He could, he could have only freed Judah from its enemies. He only could have done that. But he goes above and beyond. Not only that he took their biggest fear away, he turned it around into an abundance of blessing. Isn't that amazing? You're probably thinking that if you can just get out of this struggle, you'll be grateful. But watch how not only God will get you out of it, but he will turn the situation around to be your biggest blessing yet. This is my God. He always delivers. Then led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem. For the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps, lyres, and trumpets. Friends, remember to always give thanks to the Lord all the time. Make sure that he's not only the God of your valleys, but he's also the God of your mountain. Not only seek him when you're in trouble, when you need help, when you're struggling, but seek him even when you're rejoicing, when you're celebrating, when you're dancing and things are okay. This is the God of our valleys, but also the God of our mountains. The valley is not your destiny. It is a season. Your anxiety, your addiction, your failures is not where you land. I want you to remember that. It is a season. And God has the capacity, the power to get you out of this. He will. 
bring forth a miracle in your life. I want to invite you to close your eyes for a moment. I don't know what you're going through. But one thing I know is that you serve the God that is all-powerful. All-knowing. He knows everything. God, I come to you and I thank you for this word. Teaching us that when we go through those battles, how we should seek you in prayer. How we should confess the words that are positive, that are aligned with your word. When things don't go our way, when we don't know what to do. So this story of the kingdom of Judah, we see a blueprint of how do we go about for an answer to prayer. You are the God that I trust. You're the only one that I believe in. Thank you, God, that whatever situation that we are going through, you are with us. We love you. We're grateful that you chose us to be your children. God, show us what you're up to. Show us what you're doing. It gives us a little bit of comfort to know that you're with us. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way, but I don't want to go by my feelings. My feelings are wrong sometimes, but your word is always right. Your word is always right. And that's what I want to trust on, uh, to, 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 uh, to trust this morning. I want to trust your word that is telling us that you can get, our, get us out of this situation. Even though we do not have any way to go, we don't have anywhere else to go, we have you. And that is all that matters. We have you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen.